Hello everybody and welcome to this month's specifying practice group call. As most of you probably see on the screen right now, today's topic will be on delegated design. And for those of you on a phone or have a second screen on your computer, you can use Twitter to join the conversation as well with the hashtag CSISPG, all one word. Uh, so with that, I want to hand it over to Dave and Lewis to get started with today's session. Dave and Lewis, over to you. Thanks, Matt. This is Dave coming to you from southern New Jersey today after trekking to through Chicago and all the snow, loving every minute of it. Minute of it. <laughs> Had two wonderful days with snow during the day. It was fabulous. So, Lewis, did you see any of that snow? No, they were promising, or they said there was a, a small chance, or 50% chance of getting a little snow overnight. But uh, So it's cold and clear and hardly a cloud in the sky here in sunny Nashville. Uh, okay, well it's sunny here too, wishing for snow. So today uh, we had decided that we would try to talk about delegated design and design assist and we're starting out here with uh, two different scenarios, both of them showing up on the screen just to show uh, what I believe to be uh, some of the differences between the two and what you're seeing is actually part of another presentation that I had done earlier uh, for a different purpose but I want to use these because I think it helps to try to explain some of the differences uh, a little bit and what we're hoping that we can do today is invite all of you to join in and, and share some of your uh, experience with these things, both of them and uh, I guess I would like to start, first of all, uh, just ask by a show of raise your hand, uh, how many are actually using, I'll start with design assist. How many have actually done design assist on any of your projects? Okay, we have a few. Uh, what would you say, maybe 20%? so far. They're still raising hands. Okay, some are... <laughs> I can't keep up. They come and go. They come and go. Uh, okay, so maybe 25%. And how many are actually using delegated design? Well, on any everybody. Product? Well, not necessarily. <laughs> so let's let them answer. <laughs> you basically can't design a modern building without delegated design. Okay, so there are a few more. Not everybody, maybe they're not writing specifications. So we'll see. Okay, so let's dive into this. Um, whether or not we make it all the way through will be a, another question, but we'll see how that goes. Okay, so delegated design, I, I tend to look at this as one absolutely where the architect is retaining responsibility and it, it really follows the traditional um, design delivery method. All we're doing is delivering the contract document, signing the contract, and once the contract is signed, the documents are trying to request the contractor to try to help with the design, uh, by usually by doing some sort of an engineering, wouldn't you say, Lewis? It's well, sometimes, sometimes, but other times it's as simple as uh, telling the contractor to uh, screw attach something, and if we don't specify the uh, diameter and length of the screws and the spacing, uh, the contractor is going to do that on the basis of its skill, experience, and judgment, and so there's a sense in which that is delegated design, because if I tell them use uh, number 10 screws that are inch and a half long, spaced nine inches on center, then I take responsibility for that decision, and if it falls off the wall or flops in the breeze, then it's my problem instead of his. So I would rather let them do a lot of uh, things like picking the uh, the screws and the attachments for most things. Okay, so, but, but that's not that's not necessarily an engineering decision. That's probably more uh, based on experience and just you know common sense kind of thing. 
Okay. And then so there I, are things like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I have some questions for you about all of that, okay. what you just said, but we'll deal with that a little bit later. Keep going. Okay. So it, it, it varies from very simple things like that or, or the selecting of interior steel studs, uh, the spacing, you know, we might say the, uh, the size, the depth, that it's a 3 and 5 eighths inch stud, and we might give a minimum or rather maximum spacing, but we might also put in some criteria that they may have to select the thickness of the metal and may also be able to thick, pick the uh, spacing, go to 12 inch spacing if necessary to meet the uh, deflection and other performance criteria. And again, they're going to pick those out of a table. They're not going to have a registered engineer uh, prepare a, an engineering analysis to do that. It's just a matter of them picking the information out of a, a, a standard table. Okay. Hey, Matt, I'd like to ask you if you could check with Mark Gilligan to see if he actually has access to the phone or, or headset to be able to join this conversation. I think uh, that could be an interesting start from some of the comments that he's already submitted. Uh, Mark, so actually, while we're waiting for Mark, yeah. hopefully he can join us. If Mark wants to try, I've unmuted his line and hopes that the audio will work. Mark, are you there? No luck. Okay. And at the so the and at the far end of delegated design is. Uh, what is commonly called a pre-engineered metal building system where, base, where the entire exterior envelope of the building, including insulation, is often designed by an engineer uh, and everything from the ground up. Usually the architect, structural engineer, will still do the foundations, but everything else comes from a single source, the whole building, even the windows and doors are sometimes supplied with the um, envelope package. Right. But I think one of the important distinctions here to make with delegated design that the requirements for the delegated design are all driven by the construction contract. Right? That it all flows as a result of requirements written into the specifications. So we had a couple of questions. Uh, let me go back to Mark Gilligan. He starts out saying, should be noted that some structural engineers are, pr are preparing structural steel and even rebar shop drawings. And it should be noted that we have what may be a turf roar regards who provides design services to the project. So I'm, I haven't seen uh, that myself, Mark, where the uh, engineer of record is actually providing the steel and rebar shop drawing. So uh, if you have something more that you could shed some light on that, I'd be interested to find out what it is. Okay. So design assist to me is something entirely different. Design assist, the architect retains all the responsibility for the design and the contractor is there simply to try to help in through a process to actually get to a point where they have approved um, submittals from the contractor. So typically a design assist project would start over here where you provide prepare a design assist package. It probably includes division one requirements a basic RFP and the specifications for a specific system. And uh, the one that I drew this from was actually for an exterior envelope assembly, exterior wall. So it may have performance information about the exterior wall or whatever the architect's expectations may be. Then once it goes through that RFP process, the subcontractor, the trade contractor may be selected. They're going to negotiate a contract before they actually start providing services. Once the contract is signed, then they'll move into the design assist process. But this is very common for uh, uh, integrated project delivery uh, method of project delivery. And in some cases, uh, 
I think once or twice we've actually had a representative from like the curtain wall uh, contractor uh, come to our office and set up shop on a spare works table. Okay, and one of the things that I see as part of the design assist process is we're usually in this cycle for for a number of times where the architect will end up preparing a, an initial concept. The, con the subcontractor is going to respond to whatever that concept is and then together they're going to reconcile the differences and they'll go through the cycle several times before you actually get to a final result that could be considered a uh, potential shop drawing and ready for approval. One of the advantages of design assist is that it can in fact result in the ar architectural uh, team not having to do quite so many details as we would normally do is that because there's a deeper level of involvement and communication up front it's uh, then it's a little we don't have to do quite as much to communicate uh, the variations on the theme so to speak <laughs> to be able to put the curtain wall in 18 different places with four or five different wall types and so it can be not only a, a cost savings to the architect but also a time savings to the overall project and that's one of the reasons why people get excited about it. Okay so Lewis if you're going to decide that you do uh, design assist, is that something that you get the owner's buy-in before it ever happens? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Okay. So when you save money on your fee by engaging in design assist, you give that back to the owner? No. <laughs> well, we hope not. You know, architects' fees in real dollars have declined steadily since the 60s at the same time that they've become more complicated both technically and in terms of regulatory requirements. So, so we try to help the bottom line out a little bit. <laughs> and maybe have more time to do other higher level things. Okay. So, I mean, being, being that that was a facetious question, really, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but... I think it's an, it's an important distinction that the owner should be fully aware that if you're going to go through delegated de or through design assist that there is a shift and it may it may affect the architect's performance. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yes, I do because as I, again as I say we can we don't have to do, draw quite so many details as we would normally if it was going to be competitively bid and, and being constructed by some unknown, you know, some subcontract that we have no idea up front who it's going to be. So it all, again, that personal contact has a lot to do with not only communicating the uh, design intent, which is sometimes hard to do, but it also has to do with fostering trust because all of a sudden we've got somebody that's on the team and wants to provide something that's uh, of the same level of excellence for the owner that we want. Okay. Hey, we've had a good number of questions here already, so maybe we should try to address some of these. Okay. Uh, coming from Drake Waters, what form of standard contract do the design assist provider sign? do they have any formal authority? If no authority, is that memorialized? And if so, how? So how have you been dealing with that, Lewis, with the uh, well, design assist? With, um, basically, there, uh, I think all the cases that we've done have been in IPD projects. And so that's kind of part of the IPD contract series that comes from uh, AIA and in all candor I haven't studied those uh, in detail so I can't 
say put my finger on what paragraphs really apply, but uh, it's not necessarily a, a different standard. And you could even do it under a conventional uh, program. It's it's a matter of what is the level of confidence and uh, that the contract that the um, owner has with a construction manager, for example. Right. And on the projects where we're seeing design assist, it's usually a traditional trade subcontract uh, signed by or signed through the construction manager. Uh, oh, yes. The the, the, yeah, the, the trade subcontractor is not contracting with the owner in any way. Correct. But it, it works just as though it's a, a standard subcontract. All it is is a matter of uh, getting the subcontractor on board so that he is willing to participate because he he's expending some effort and needs to be assured that he's going to be paid for that effort. Right, and that answers Dave Metzger's question about how is design assist bid. Uh, it's really a matter of it's a sub bid, and it's a matter of negotiating uh, on the basis of uh, design development drawings that are far enough along to say what kind of system is there, what is the basic design intent, what are the design criteria, and the subcontractor says, oh, yeah, I can do that, and here's how I plan to do it, and once everybody's in agreement with that, then they can go forward. Yeah, and I want to answer Dave's second part of the question, is how, is, how are they bidding all of those unknowns? And one of the things, Dave, if you um, could remember the very first um, or the major overall slide that I had up. There was a negotiation period after the details were settled. So that once they know what the scope really is and how they're going to attack the scope, there's another negotiation period uh, to be able to finalize that subs um, contract based upon the agreed design. Because you're right, there are a lot of unknowns and if, and if you try to capture all those to begin with, you're paying a huge contingency uh, going forward on the construction contract. Um, uh, Dave Walters asked how is design assist not actually more work for the AE as they vet and counter the DA proposals that are problematic. Uh, again, this is we need to see this in context as that it's not a matter of kind of after the fact assignment, it's something that develops as the design is developing and we get to the point where we are uh, in basic agreement with the CM on, let, let's take curtain wall as being one of the most common factors, is the basic profile, the basic type of curtain wall, is it, uh, you know, a true uh, exterior pressure plate system, what kind of glass is in it, what are the uh, performance criteria that we want it to match, what's the aesthetic criteria that we want it to match, and once those things have been documented, then the uh, when the uh, subcontractor comes on board, is gets a subcontract before the construction documents are finished, then we can work with them and they can draw a lot of the details that we would not normally detail. So we're not vetting anymore. Uh, we're still looking at the same submittals. They may have a few, few more details that they're drawing instead of us having to draw. Okay, we had, we had some more questions and I see one, Dave Metzger, I'm going to have to postpone your question now that I've gone backwards, but we'll, we'll get to that one. Um, we have one from uh, Steve Groth asking, in the way I understand the description of design assist, it sounds like construction costs are not known until after the process is complete, which happens sometime during construction. If that is correct, is this a viable option for public bidding scenario? How do you address the typical public bidding requirement of having three products or manufacturers? Steve, I, I personally have not seen design assist used on a public bid project. Uh, have you, Lewis? No. Um, again, it's mostly IDP, but it can be a, a typical CMC kind of construction where at the end of design development, we know what we want. And 
the, if it's a CMC uh, construction manager constructor contract, that uh, the CM is going to develop a GMP at the end of design development. So there shouldn't be any huge surprises as we go into CDs that the basic cost is worked out. And so the, what the, the design assist is doing is more just fleshing out how does the uh, curtain wall fit against ACM in this corner of the building and fit against brick down at the bottom and fit against the roof, uh, match up with the roof at the parapets and that sort of thing, uh, rather than you know completely coming up with some new unknown system that we haven't seen before. Okay. We had another comment from Tommy Smith asking us to discuss deferred submittals as defined oh, yeah. in IVC. And Tommy, we will get to that. Uh, just give us a couple of minutes. Uh, Greta Eckhart is making a comment saying, I think the key to both delegated design and design assist is to clearly identify design intent and performance criteria, communicate this information as unambiguously as possible. And that's very well said, and of course, that's one of the critical things that a preliminary project description can do for us. And Greta is working with David and me on the CSI task team that is going to be, that is in the process of updating PPD format. So that's a, a very cogent remark. Okay. So why don't we uh, press on here a bit yeah. and uh, see if we can answer some of these other questions that are coming up. Okay. So here's the question to you, Louis. Dave Metzger asks, pectoral documents? Is that something you want to get off your chest? <laughs> hey, you're the one that transcribed it. Oh, you weren't I? supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for catching that, Dave. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So the code, looking at the IBC, uh, we want to make sure that everybody realizes that delegated design really is not mentioned in IBC at all. Uh, it's implicit, though. It's not explicit, and it does not use that term. If you look in the, in the index, you will not find the term delegated design. And However, did, did everyone ahead. realize construction documents by definition in IBC? The written documents get number one billing. Surprise, surprise. Okay. So Tommy was asking about the deferred submittal. So let, why don't you go ahead and take this one, Lewis? Well, let's go to first, let's go to, um, I know it's out of sequence, but let's go to the slide about the um, sprinklers. Sprinklers? So, yeah, I think it's the next slide. You sure? We'll find out. There it is. No, that's a different one. Yeah, I'm not sure that that's in here. Oh, okay. okay well, so you have to talk first. Well, let me let me start by saying that one of the places where they mention what we <laughs> call delegate design very specifically is that in uh, the area 107 of the of the code, there's a specific mention of uh, fire protection shop system shop drawings. It's 107.2.2 .2, and it talks about how the shop drawings are to be submitted to indicate conformance to the code and that they shall be approved prior to the start of system installation and shop drawings shall contain all information as required by the reference installation standards in Chapter 9. So it's, that's one place where the code is recognizing up front that the AE, the design professional and responsible charge of the project, is not going to produce construction documents for the project. And, uh, and they are an example of what they call in 107.3.4.2 a deferred submittal, a portion of the design not submitted at the time of the building permit but can is to be um, would be uh, submitted at a later date and in most cases 
those are shop drawings that are actually prepared by the contractor. So they are construction documents for permitting, but they are not contract documents between the contractor and the owner. And we've got everybody confused on that one. Correct. Not contract documents in the term that the AE did not uh, prepare them. Right. But they are construction documents. So let's go to that next slide. Okay. But I did want to mention you, you didn't deal with this uh, second paragraph oh, here. I'm the sorry. Deferral, the deferred submittals. They're supposed yes. to have prior approval and they're actually supposed to be noted on the contract documents that are submitted for permit. Well, in effect, they are, because uh, if the plan examiner were to look at the project manual, I'll pause while everybody finishes laughing, the, the specs would very clearly show which sections are things like curtain wall and other things that are uh, what we would call delegated design that are going to be deferred submittal items. So, okay. yeah, that's one of those things that's not overly enforced. <laughs> okay, so this is the one you were looking for. Well, and uh, it's the next one. It's something that it's not directly germane to our discussion, but it's something that we all need to remind ourselves about. Is that the the building code is set up on the concept that there is one person or one entity who is designated as the person who is in responsible to charge of the entire project and is responsible for reviewing and coordinating submittal documents prepared by others, whether those others are registrants, um, professional engineering consultants, or the contractor. Right. And, and in, the and reason in this I, case too, the submittal documents here those are referring to the documents being submitted for building permit. Yes, not necessarily contract documents, but for the building permit. And one of the things that we sometimes run into is, I've run into a few times over the years, is we have owners who are just such terrible cheapskates <clears throat> that they don't want the architect to get a markup on the fee for the structural, plumbing, mechanical, electrical engineers. The owner wants to hire them directly. But the problem is, under the, the building code, that's not overly legal. Somebody has to take this responsibility for reviewing and coordinating submittal documents, whether, again, whether they are prepared by the registrants as contract documents or prepared by the contractor as, as uh, shop drawings. Uh, and that takes a certain amount of, of time, and it takes and it's certainly a liability risk, and all to be compensated for. But that's a footnote, a sidebar. Okay. So a question for you from your friend Tommy, uh, Lewis. Oh, he's not your friend anymore? <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. Uh, Tommy is both of our friends. So are deferred submittals considered contract documents? And I'd have to say no, because <clears throat> um, not under the A201 uh, contract. Now, under the AGC, I'm going to say so-called consensus docs, one of the major differences between their version of general conditions and the AIA general conditions is that under the AGC contract, once the um, AE firm approves submittals, shop drawings, they become contract documents, but okay. not normally. All right. And I'm going to put someone else on the spot now here. Now, the deferred too. submittals can be contract documents because, again, if we're doing a multiple work package project, and by the by, everyone here, I hope, is, has bought a copy of CSI's new publication on that subject that... Uh, some good folks put together, uh, that the, for fast track construction, we're not going to issue all the documents at once. And so we may issue first the foundations, and then one of the deferred submittals is going to be 
the uh, envelope package, and then another deferred submittal would be the uh, the core and the architectural interiors and so on, and where there may be uh, quite a few of those work packages that are deferred submittals that are contract documents. Okay. Lewis, I'd like to try to put somebody else here on the spot. Sure. Robin Snyder, I see you were on the call, and I, I threatened by a phone call message that if you were available, perhaps you would want to join us. So if, if you're able to do the audio, you want to raise your hand, and maybe Matt can unmute you so you can join this conversation. Oh, Robin's not taking us up on that. <laughs> Okay. okay. So one of the things that we put out in our teaser for the uh, announcement of today's session is uh, what design work can't be delegated. And David is going to explain that to us. Well, <laughs> what, what I want to make sure that everybody understands is under AIA A201 general conditions, standard AIA conditions, that the whole discussion about the delegated design responsibilities of the contractor occurs under the article about shop drawings, product data, and samples. So oh, and we, uh, David, forgive me for interrupting you, but we might observe that the A201 does not use the phrase delegated design either. No, it does not. So the delegated design is uh, something that we that I probably first saw appear in master spec as a way to identify having the contractor provide design services to, uh, as part of the contract documents. So the general conditions really uh, put, put some limits but then allow the contractor to be able to provide the design uh, because it's saying that the contractor is not required to provide anything that would be that would be constituted as professional services unless and that unless is if the contract actually requires it specifically requires the contractor to provide that service so when the when the specifications do include the requirement for uh, delegated design the owner and and architect are responsible because the contract is between the owner and the contractor. They must specify all performance and design criteria. And that has to be enough for the contractor to actually provide the design service. And again, that goes back to the concept of the design professional in responsible charge who is responsible for coordinating all the work of the project to uh, ensure compliance with the building code. So code compliance is really the ultimate responsibility of the, of the AE who is, own, is uh, under contract to the owner. And what basically one of our chief responsibilities is to interpret the code as it applies to this project on this site. And then we can, from that, establish certain criteria. For example, uh, we might have an odd-shaped building. We know what the design wind speed is in a given area, but because of the odd-shaped building, we might even have to uh, put a model in a, a wind tunnel to determine the actual wind pressures at corners and at the roof and so forth. And then we give that information to the contractor who will then employ a, uh, a professional engineer to design the curtain wall attachments and movement capabilities that will meet those criteria. But I, I think the end of the discussion in 201 is actually one of the most important. It says yes. The contractor <laughs> is not responsible for the adequacy of the performance and design criteria. So if we specify performance and design criteria, 
and the contractor follows exactly what it is that is specified in per, in producing his final design, he can't be held liable for anything that may be missing. Right, and that's that's based on the Spearin doctrine that from that court case, what, in 1914, was it? Tommy will tell me with the chat. If, I, the chat I'm not going to quote the year, but yes, it is the Spearin doctrine where it's by producing the contract documents and the owner providing those documents to the contractor, there is an implied warranty that should the contractor actually produce the construction based you know, meeting the requirements of the contract documents, he's fulfilled the contract. Yes, and, and Tommy says it's 1918. Thanks, Tommy. That okay. one's near and dear to his heart. It should be near and dear to every specifier's heart. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, but I wasn't going to remember that date. Okay, so we talked a little bit around about what really can be delegated. And virtually any design could be delegated. And here's a, just a list of some of the common things that I see uh, on virtually all of our projects, except for the last item, the theme facade. That doesn't occur all that often uh, in most well, construction. I, um, at my previous firm, the firm did a number of uh, entertainment venues and uh, I remember writing a spec for a, a bar in the hotel that had a flame feature. <laughs> Not a water feature, but a flame feature. And so you had this wall that had little boxes with gas-fired flames in them that had to be contained. And I wasn't a, we weren't about to go into that in great detail. We just show uh, and, and tell the, guy, the contractor exactly how to build that. We knew that that's in over our heads, so we got to that uh, we required a specialty kind of contractor to, to do it and we set the criteria to told them what we want to see but uh, that's it. That was a, an example of a themed uh, structure that was delegated design. Okay, so the building official must have loved that feature. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it was for, actually it was for a native Indian uh, community and they are usually exempt from the local building inspectors. They are sovereign, they have under their sovereign immunity and so they can approve whatever they want to basically. And I, I don't mean that in a, in a disparaging way, it's just that, uh, that they can, uh, they have they their don't, own powers. Yes, they don't have the same rules. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that 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 would certainly be an interesting themed sort of uh, feature. But the right. and well, here we see here we see a custom canopy where uh, again uh, this is our was done by our firm. It's the uh, at the new international uh, terminal at the Atlanta airport. And you know we drew some sketches that are basically concept sketches. And then a specialty contractor took it and uh, designed it and was responsible for all the engineering, selecting the glass, and, uh, and installing it at the same time. And we might say that most of these delegated design things are delegated design build, that the, the person who, the entity who is designing them is also going to install them. Well, I think that's normally the case because you're asking the subcontractor to provide the design service, typically. Yes. Typically. Okay. So, what cannot be delegated? Ah, well, we kind of covered that. Yes. Th I mean, re really, this is the one thing that cannot be delegated because the uh, design professional in responsible charge is required for code compliance. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of that has to do with interpreting the code for this particular project on this particular site. 
Right. So simply specifying the performance as in compliance with the code is not really sufficient because there are a number of choices that must be made to be able to actually set the criteria sufficiently for the contractor to complete the design. For instance, the wind, wind load. What, what, um, what is the basic wind speed that they're trying to use? Because some of that is actually interpreted between the ISO bars. You know, what is the importance factor? You know, what, what is the height that they're looking at? You know, and you know, all kinds of different other uh, code requirements depending upon what you're trying to design. And, and some of it is just plain old judgment factor that uh, uh, we're de designing a, a high rise that's on the the main hill here in downtown Nashville where the uh, pretty close to the state capitol building and to the west of it is a uh, is the valley where I-65 goes through and on the far side of I-65 there's nothing much in the way of construction so the wind is going to roar across that valley and hit our building uh, full force so to speak so uh, the structural engineer has to uh, evaluate that as well as you know, on top of just the ordinary stuff about importance factor and wind speed. Right, because you may select something much higher in the way of wind pressure just because of your special conditions. Exactly. Uh, we might back up just a little bit. Um, Tommy asked the question, does the contractor warrant compliance with performance criteria in terms of the general warranty by the contractor in paragraph A 3.51 of A201? And I would have to say yes. I mean, that's obviously if we make uh, performance a, con a, a, uh, a contract requirement, then yes, the, that is covered by the, the warranty. So if we, say, design the, the thing for a certain wind pressure and we have a windstorm that's less than that design pressure and we lose a couple of lights, yeah, the contractor is responsible for fixing it. Okay, so delegated design. Can we delegate aesthetic concerns, not performance? Well, yes and no. I think so. Um, again, at my previous firm, because we did a lot of uh, uh, hospitality kinds of projects, uh, one of our projects, uh, we uh, had a, a very large atrium, like two and a half acres under Skylight. It was built in, uh, it's in Orlando, it's the Gaylord Palms Hotel. And one end of this uh, large atrium is a uh, um, is uh, was supposed to be like the Everglades, and so there was a building in there that was meant to look like an old fishing shack, and so I actually wrote some performance specifications about the uh, to make the the wood look like it's aged and distressed and one thing and another. Um, because rather than specifying, you know, how much, what sandpaper to use to put the, the scratches on the, on the walls and how to do the paint and how to apply dirt and that sort of thing, I just described it in, in, uh, in general terms. And by the way, I used a, uh, a format like a pre preliminary project description to do that. It was uh, organized by Uniformat and had references to the master format sections for the different actual products that components that were parts of the assemblies. So did, did some of your specs look something like this? <laughs> Well, but we also have that uh, paragraph in our curtain wall sections that, you know, if this manufacturer's uh, uh, profile is an eighth of an inch or less or longer than the, the next guy's, that's okay. But if it's more than a quarter of an inch, let's talk. <laughs> because I, when you get down to the aesthetic, some of this stuff, while it sounds silly, you know, this could actually change 
the entire impression that you're giving. Uh, I think about some of the uh, casino projects in Las Vegas and elsewhere where the entire interior uh, public space is essentially themed and it's all based upon trying to get a particular perception in a particular area of the casino uh, whether you know to try to drive more revenue in most cases uh, from the casino uh, that you need to be careful about what it is that you're trying to accomplish with some of these aesthetic uh, concerns and uh, Tommy Smith points out that you uh, uh, that he has specified aesthetic requirements for slate roofing uh, to, to, to try to give, I assume, to try to achieve the proper uh, historical appearance. Mm -hmm. oh, Sheldon asks, did you say that you can't delegate performance? Not, Not that I remember. <laughs> Sheldon, if I said that, that's... <laughs> I, I apologize if I did say that because I don't recall saying it, but uh, I think you can delegate performance. I mean, that's virtually... Performance requirements, yes. Re requirements, correct, because that's what you're really transmitting to the contractor to be able to complete a design. Okay. Well, how do we find out if uh, the, the design meets our performance requirements, David? Well, AIA... A201, still under the uh, submittals requirements for the contractor, sets up the, the start of the rules saying the architect will review, approve, or take other appropriate action, whatever that might be, on the submittals, but only for the limited purpose of checking conformance with the information given. And this is going back to uh, the code requirements, too, that we're actually required to check the contractor submittals based upon the information that we're providing to the contractor uh, to actually create that submittal. So what the submittals are required for a couple of things. Number one, the building official, we have to meet that building code and actually submit the deferred submittal uh, where it is a design that the architect has passed off to the contractor. And the architect also has to review that submittal for the compliance with the contract documents. So what I am looking for when I'm using delegated design is really three things. Sign and sealed shop drawings because we're going to use those drawings as a submittal to the building official. Signed and sealed calculations where it's an engineering um, delegated design because the building official is going to require that. and proof of professional liability insurance by the entity providing the design because what I'm looking for is a way to help make sure that the architect is not bare because the subcontractor or the general contractor has not provided professional liability insurance because they are assuming the same kind of risk that the architect is providing uh, or assuming because of the delegated design. Now, do you feel like that's really important for, let's talk about curtain wall since that's been our primary example throughout this, that the, when we, uh, whether it's Old Castle or Colonier or YKK or whomever, uh, a major manufacturer that, perf that has engineers on its staff and they're going to back up the design and ultimately it's uh, there's a shared responsibility between the manufacturer, the employer of this engineer, and the engineer personally. Do we still need uh, PL insurance? Absolutely. Because whether it's, in this case, if you're talking about a curtain wall manufacturer, the manufacturer should have PL insurance to cover the de uh, the design that the that his employees are providing and the GC should also have a PL insurance policy covering the subcontractor it should all flow downhill and it ought to in be in place in in help of the architect because the architect has given up 
the responsibility for that design. So let's, let's ask our crowd, that's my opinion, uh, again by raising your hand, how many are actually providing or requiring uh, professional liability insurance, E&O, from contractors and subcontractors providing delegated design. So just use raise your hand, how many of you are actually doing this on a regular basis? Not very many. I see three so far. So I would ask yeah, any, any one of you three that raised your hand, if you have audio available, keep your hand up or put your hand back up and let's see if we can get you on the call and explain your position. We might also ask Paul Brosnahan why Master Spec doesn't have that requirement. Okay, and nobody's willing to join the conversation with us. <laughs> did, did you offend them? <laughs> no, I think people are just awed by your overwhelming uh, knowledge and understanding of all this arcane stuff. That's frightening. Ah, but here's Bill Bourgeois. He stuck his hand up. Uh, Greta has a comment. Uh, oh. She says Just, maybe the code allows us to delegate aesthetic concern, concerns, but how can anyone bid such documents? Perhaps we can defer aesthetic decisions such as color and pattern selection, but the general characteristic of these should be carefully documented and controlled by the architect as early in the design construction process as possible. Otherwise, allowances or unit prices may need to are need to be used to control costs due to the architect's later decisions or approvals. Well, great. I can say that in my experience uh, on using aesthetic descriptions on these theme developments, which are granted not an ordinary thing, it's a matter of how much can I describe that is a is appropriate uh, describing them what we want this fishing shack to look like that it looks that it looks worn the paint's worn and it's got some distress and some cracked boards and so forth um, on the regards to that uh, flame uh, feature in the uh, casino bar uh, I could you know our drawings kind of showed how big the box was and we could talk about the size of the flame and how it's controlled and things like that. So there are ways to describe that even for uh, for competitive pricing. Okay, we do have Bill uh, Dubois that oh, good. has joined on the audio. So Bill, yeah, are you you requiring the PL insurance? You yes. did raise your hand. I did. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes. Go ahead. You good. Um, yes, we have an in-house attorney who you've met, um, and we do review to make sure that we do have that any um, outside service like that that we have as a consulting service, that they do carry their professional liability insurance, or we do not enter an agreement with them. So does that make sense? It does to me. And um, what sort of a uh, PL are you asking them to carry? Is it the same? Uh, limit says your own policy or is it something other? I honestly don't know personally. I know that our in-house attorney has a set, a, a set of requirements and I believe there's a administration. I, I think it's the same limits that we have as the match our to match the contract that we have with the owner. The yeah, project. it probably would match the, our contract requirements as well. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that, Bill. I appreciate it. Sure. And uh, Paul Brosnahan says that he'll check with uh, the writers at uh, Master Spec on that. So we'll, perhaps he can share that with us, and then we can distribute uh, his answer to the to the uh, attendees today. Okay. And just because we're coming up here on the hour, I just we want to sort of circle back with design assist because we spent a lot of time talking about delegated design and I just want to reiterate that I see design assist as it's a collaborative process what with the ultimate goal for design assist is to get to an approved shop drawing 
that can actually be used for construction. So we talked a little bit about this earlier when I was showing you the circular um, pattern that was going on with design assist. You know, you're going to have the architect suggest something, the subcontractor implement it, both of them sit down, review and refine it, and they're going to repeat that process as often as it takes until they get to the final where it's an approvable uh, shop drawing that they can move into construction. And there we are. We've made it through. Are there any remaining questions there, Louis? We haven't touched. There are a couple of comments. Uh, Jim Spinola says, for non-proprietary projects where I specify basis of design, I require delegated design if the contractor wishes to prove, provide an approved equal. If it is structural or envelope related, I will require E and O as required by the owners, legal and insurance advisors. And then Mark Bartlett says, what, how, would or should the verbiage requiring P and L insurance be stated? Well, we. That's a little beyond, the, unfortunately, how we, the time limits that we have. And Mary Noe says regarding PL insurance, I have specified that the contractor provides design of steel stairs, signed in steel drawings and calculations, but I've never mentioned PL insurance. This is a new thought for me. Bill's case sounded more like design assist with four question marks. Okay, I, I would like to take the question from Mark about how and where you might specify uh, PL insurance. And Mark, for the most time, I actually end up specifying it in Division 1. And the rationale for me is that I am rarely involved in uh, specifying supplementary conditions for the kinds of projects uh, that we're uh, specifying. So without the ability to be able to talk with the owner and be able to influence those supplementary conditions, which, which is where I believe it rightfully belongs, that I want to still make sure that the architect is able to be covered. So I am relying heavily on Division 1 to accomplish that. So I really only have to say the, or state the requirement once. Uh, why don't you um, address Mary's question a little bit? Uh, I don't see this as being restricted to design assist. Uh, that it's a, oh it's for the PNL. Yeah, yeah, and I think and it's an I issue. Don't that, uh, I mean, most design assist also involves delegated design. Because again, we're talking about curtain wall. We're talking about decorative canopies at the entrance that are. And, and other things that uh, are really outside the competency of the most architects and engineers to design. Right. I'm not going to design curtain wall. You're right. Design assist could involve delegated design as well. The design assist, though, just because of the responsibility, the architect still has the responsibility of for the final design details, which is what you're really trying to work through in the process. So that liability and, and the, uh, e, uh, the E and O insurance would still flow through the architect. Now, if you did end up with delegated design as a result, say for the curtain wall, if, if that was the design assist package, the delegated design then would flow with the E and O down to the subcontractor. So it's Im I think it's important to understand, and I think the P PL insurance is an important topic to discuss with the owner and the architect to make sure that proper coverage extends for the entire project. The only thing I can the caveat, though, or or not a caveat, but uh, a counter argument is that in the case of a curtain wall. The, the contractor, of course, is under um, product uh, liability, whereas the architect engineer who designed the facility is under professional liability. And there's a sense in which if the contractor, if the uh, curtain wall is designed uh, 
and it's got the shop drawings are drawn on old castles or Conier's, uh title blocks. We're actually talking about a product liability that if it fails, it's a product liability and not a professional liability. I would leave it to the insurer insurer <laughs> to argue that, but I would I would right. venture I, my my two cents that if you're requiring a licensed professional engineer or architect to contribute to the design, that that is what's going to drive the requirement for PL. Well, yes, but on the other hand, there are lots of other things. Like if you just buy a window and you don't require des delegated design, an engineer designed that window to, f to meet certain wind criteria. But you don't necessarily need shop drawings to install those windows in a, you know, a, a two-story medical office building. Correct. And we can so take this for a long time. Is, <laughs> because that's that's a product liability. And well, anyway. Okay. Well, next so we're at the hour. We have no idea what we're going to do, so keep those cards and letters coming in, friends and neighbors. And you know. To, David and I feel very strongly about that this is your program and we try to, you know, guide the discussion, but we want to talk about what is important to you. So let us know uh, okay. if you've got so something. Next month's meeting is March 5th, the first Thursday. And we will certainly get Matt to send out the notice and let you know, uh, but following all of your suggestions too, so please do uh, send in your suggestions. Okay.